it's full time. Hello and welcome to Full Time, brought to you by AIA Vitality. I'm Shane Crawford, and this man we're going to chat to all the way up in Queensland in the beautiful hub that he is in, having the time of his life. It and Woolly, come on in. How are you? You're looking magnificent. Going very well, thank you, Crawford. I thought you might get a gig actually in that last transition hub that the AFL's got going in a couple of days, but disappointing that I think you've, you're stuck there, eh? No, I decided I should stay and, um, and hang out with all the Victorians and work our way through it and just watch it on the TV and, uh, and no doubt tune into Channel 9 every night for all the updates you're giving us, which is fantastic. What is happening up there? Well, great question. I've just been up to uh, Maroochydore today on the Sunshine mm -hmm. Coast, so a couple of hour drive up the highway to watch the Bombers train, the Joe Show. I know we're going to touch <laughs> on that later. I did get very excited seeing him uh, a couple of days ago. Who did they play again? Hawthorne, was it? Oh, that's right. Uh, I missed that one. Uh, not sure what happened there, but no, that was fantastic. I'll tell you what, watching Joe Dennehur go about it. But we're going to launch into the round four results. And as you said, Essendon, what an amazing second half of football. 16-point victors over the very, very disappointing Hawks, especially in that second half. The Tigers, hey, can they win another grand final? It's looking likely. 27-point uh, victors over the West Coast Eagles. The Cats got it done, had to work hard, but then really locked into gear. Dangerfield on fire. Port Adelaide, uh, just keep winning, sitting up right up in the top of the ladder. Uh, Fremantle, disappointing against the Giants. Well done to the Giants. They found a way to win, and they worked as a team, something they haven't been doing for quite some time. The Ds, what a game against the Saints. That was a nail-biter. Christian Petrarca in form once again. And the Blues, very disappointing today to not get over the Pies. This was a very winnable game for them to get the Pies when they were a bit wounded. But I'll tell you what, if you don't kick any goals in the second half of the game, you don't deserve to win. Very disappointing from the Blues' point of view. Very good from Collingwood's point of view, who just keep chalking up the wins, Ed, and they just, uh, they just keep getting the job done. Yeah, let's take a look at those scores. As you mentioned, uh, no goals in the second half from Carlton. Now, leading at half time, and it was a really entertaining first half. It looked like this might be maybe their coming of age this afternoon where they really announced themselves, Corf, as a, as a finalist. But I know there's a lot of frustrated Blues fans tonight that this rebuild is just, it's ongoing. Yeah, it's very frustrating. Like, when you play so well in, in the first half, Sometimes you don't want half time to come because you just want the momentum to continue. But well done from Collingwood's point of view. They're undermanned. But you know what? They've won four out of their last five. Yes, they've been against lower-ranked sides, but they just keep getting the job done. Uh, Cox kicked some goals. Majek, Stevenson, um, Taylor Adams uh, continues his great form. And Collingwood just keep winning. And that's all you need to do this time of the year. If you can get a few soldiers back towards the, uh, the final season. Um, you know, they're holding themselves in a very good place. A lot of people started to doubt the Pies, but I'll tell you what, uh, a lot of credit needs to go to the coaching staff and also the players and the depth of their list and what they've been able to do. Well, this is the run home for Collingwood. They've got a massive clash against Brisbane at the Gabba next week before the bye, the Suns and then Port Adelaide. So two pretty tough games there. You'd expect them to probably take care of the Gold Coast, but... Um, they really needed to win that game today to, to cement their spot, don't they, Croft? Yeah, and do you know what? I reckon they'll stay in the top eight. Um, you know, I reckon they can definitely win another one, maybe even two, depending on who they get back and, and the freshness that they've got in their legs after having that bye. Um, look, on the bubble, if we have a look on the bubble at the ninth, GWS had a great win on the weekend. Western Bulldogs in Essendon. I just don't trust those three sides at the moment. So I'm happy to say that the, uh, the top eight is pretty much going to stay how it is today with Melbourne, Collingwood and St Kilda being in there. They may change positions, but I don't think the top eight will change from a top eight. So, um, you know, St Kilda fans, I think they're playing so well, they'll find a way to, uh, to stay in there. Collingwood, yes, they can chalk up another win, maybe two. And Melbourne... Well, what a win against the Saints. It was fantastic. They're getting better as the season goes on, and I can see them certainly sneaking into the eight and, uh, and being a bit of a force. Yeah, good call, Croft. These definitely have been uh, much better in recent weeks, led by your man, Christian Petrarca. But what does that mean for the finals picture? Interesting, no GWS, so they've sort of woken from their slumber, it felt like. But 
You haven't got them playing first week finals. So what do you think it looks like? No, I, I don't trust them. And um, so I'm not putting them in, although they were fantastic and they showed some real positive signs on the weekend. OK, so I've done my predictions and I'm always spot on. Uh, so the first week of the finals, we're going to have Port Adelaide take on Geelong. I reckon uh, Geelong might drop one... Uh, along the way and, and sneak down to fourth. Brisbane take on Richmond, which is going to be a beauty. West Coast are going to finish fifth, so they'll take on Collingwood, who I think might finish eighth on the ladder. And Melbourne and St Kilda, we saw them in a nail-biter on the weekend. That is going to be uh, a great final to watch. So that's what I'm predicting week one of the finals. I know we've still got a few weeks to go, but I thought I'd have a crack, and that's what I think is going to happen in 2020. Well, we'll certainly be holding you to account there, Croft. We'll bring that up in a few weeks' time when it's completely different. But Collingwood <laughs> fans, uh, geez, they'd be having some dom sheet nightmares if they're an elimination, elimination final, even against the Eagles in week one. Just before we move on, uh, we've sort of glossed over Carlton a bit just then. And I reckon that happens with Carlton. They seem to get a free pass so often because of this rebuild. But today, does that say something about the leadership of that side and the maturity of that side that they offer nine-day break versus Collingwood's Six, I think it was, that they couldn't get that done. Collingwood with so many names out today, as we've mentioned. Well, you know, a lot of people were giving him a great chance, obviously with that break, um, you know, fear, that freshness in their legs. And that's what, what the disappointing thing is. They were so good in that first half. But the second half, uh, you've got to bring it. And Collingwood really hunted them. Um, you know, the tackling pressure was there. Uh, they just worked as a really well-oiled machine. And, um, yeah, the Blues behind closed doors would be extremely disappointed, and so they should. That was their chance to keep their finals alive for season 2020. They won't be a part of finals action anymore, and it's such a fine line. So back to the drawing board. Um, the good thing about this year, they've shown that they can match it with uh, a lot of the top eight sides, but they need that real mental uh, capacity to you know, play a good four-quarter effort. And unfortunately, uh, they really dropped the ball against an arch rival. So it's now 127 apiece. Can you believe it? 127 wins apiece and four draws over their history. That's just incredible. It certainly is. I think Collingwood might have been gaining some ground in recent years on that one. But no Carlton in your finals picture. The Blues fans would certainly be disappointed with that. This was the response after the game from Carlton coach David T. Uh, probably a little bit frustrating. Um, there were some really good signs at times, and then at, at other times we, we couldn't finish our plays. Um, yeah, we, the second half, to Collingwood's credit, they, they got the game on their terms, and, and we didn't play it the way we wanted to play it. All right, time now for a look at the game underway tonight. The massive clash between the Gold Coast and North Melbourne. Sorry, I'm being a bit facetious there, but the Suns leading the Roos by 25 points at half time. Crawford. Probably the way you'd expect that match to go at the moment. Yeah, I'm loving... Uh, well, Gold Coast, uh, everyone was uh, picking them to win this match and we needed to see a good effort from uh, the Kangaroos, but Gold Coast certainly started in the right manner. Isaac Rankin was on fire. He was involved in pretty much every goal that uh, Gold Coast were putting through the big sticks. If he doesn't win the Rising Star, well, goodness gracious me. It would have been interesting if Matt Rowe had continued his form, obviously... Uh, he was in red-hot form, but whether or not you can continue that throughout the whole season as a young player becomes pretty tough, and I'm sure the opposition teams would have put a lot of work into him. So it might have been, uh, you know, a flip of the coin at the end of the season. Is it Matt Rowe? Is it Isaac Rankin? But he is just absolutely the class. And th the great thing about him, whenever he gets the footy, especially out wide, he's always turning his head and he's always looking inside, whereas a lot of other players, they just put, uh, they put the blinkers on and they look straight. And that's the way they play. But he's always trying to bring in players from, uh, from a better position and a more dangerous position, which is just fantastic. But Gold Coast are playing well. North Melbourne are putting up a bit of a fight, but a very disappointing year from North Melbourne's point of view, although they do have many injuries and uh, they are giving a lot of younger players the opportunity to get out and have a run around. Hey, Croft, bit of news round tonight. Uh, Toby Green, again, been in hot water. He's been walking that tightrope in regards to... Match review, of course. He's had a number of fines and suspensions over the years. Tonight, he's escaped suspension again, free to play Carlton next week. He got a $1,000 fine for striking Fremantle's Reese Conker off the ball. It was, the ball was nowhere near it, really. So he is a touch lucky, but probably the right outcome graded as, as low impact. The other news around tonight involves goal line technology and the AFL today admitting or reacting quickly, I guess, to that controversial moment between Melbourne and St Kilda last night in which your man... 
Christian Petrarca kicked what turned out to be the match-winning goal. It looked like it maybe was touched, or at least pretty close to the line, by Dougal Howard. Well, now goal line technology will be at every venue for the remainder of the season. So the AFL reacting to that result and that kick from Christian Petrarca, who I think might be coming up in the Sunday roast. Hey, I, all I can say is uh, in the arc, um, it makes it very, very difficult for them to make a decision when some of the camera shots are so far away initially anyway. So uh, it just makes sense. If you're going to have technology on the line, I think the umpire got it right because he was right there and that was his initial thought. And the thing is, it puts so much doubt in our minds because the camera angle's so far away, yet it sort of gives you half a chance to think that it might have been on the line. But the goal umpire's right there. They normally make the right decision, so I think we've got to back them in. But if you're going to use technology like that, just put a little camera in the goalpost. It's not hard. Find a little spot for it. Cut a little hole, put it in there. OK, one high, one low. And that'll tell us every time uh, the ball um, is touched on the line or it's not. And then we can just get on with the game. And there won't be no if, maybe, or uh, questionable decisions. I think it's pretty easy. Well, aren't you fired up, Croft? Love it. Uh, after I gave that fantastic segue to the roast, <laughs> it's take two for the Sunday roast. We'll try again. Now, all those Petrarca deniers out there, how dare you? Yes, six or seven weeks ago, I said Christian Petrarca. I think he's gone past Dusty. A lot of people in the media have taken it all the wrong way. I didn't say he had gone past his career as a player, but this year on what he was producing, I thought he was more impactful and uh, he was having a better season. To Dusty's credit, he's been incredible, especially over the last five or six weeks, and it's a pleasure to watch. But I tell you what, my man Christian Petrarca hasn't backed off. He is just having an absolute impact. He kicked four on the weekend. His last goal, yes, it was controversial, but he had three opponents. Players don't do that. Normally, you'd have one-on-one. -on -one. He had three around him, yet he was still able to get the ball, slam it on the boot, and it was a match-winning performance. So, I'll tell you what, anyone who was doubting Christian Petrarca as being the number one player in the competition this year, 2020, I'm happy to look you in the eye and take you on. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm just hearing a few murmurs out of Melbourne that Christian Petrarca might be a little worried about your obsession with him, actually, Croft. But, look, oh. I will give you some credit where it's due. You were ahead of the curve on this one. He's now second in Brownlow betting behind Lockie Neal. Do you think he can win the Brownlow this year? Well, of course he can. You know, he's had a super consistent season. Uh, when Melbourne have played well, someone's got to get the three votes. Um, is it Max Gorn? Is it Viney? Is it Christian Petrarca? Um, he has only scored five Brownlow uh, votes over his whole career. So that is a bit of an alarming uh, statistic to then launch yourself in and win the Brownlow medal off a, a really good consistent year. So maybe this year gives him a bit of momentum, gets the umpires talking about him, and maybe next year, and Lockie Neal maybe for this year. Well, Croft, maybe he needs to give you a phone call just about how to talk up to the umps after the game to get those... No, you don't talk to them at all. Um, if you say anything, it's just you're doing a great job. Keep up the good work, Mr Umpire. <laughs> it's very, very important. <laughs> hey, uh, can I ask you a couple of questions? Uh, just, um, I want to know what's going on with the grand final. We all think it's going to happen um, in Queensland and be played at the Gabba. Um, apparently, with their bid, they put in a, a, a Super Bowl feel going to be played at night or uh, a twilight match. So there'll be lots of fireworks. Their Commonwealth Games uh, a few years ago, they had lots of fireworks. They had lots of tropical fish. So w what are they going to bring to the table? And who, if it is going to be played at the Gabba, who's going to be performing? Is it sort of an angry Anderson style sort of Waverley Park? Or is it Bruno Mars, someone who's going to blow the Gabba apart? <laughs> Geez, great questions, Croft. I don't know if Gillan McLaughlin even knows the answer to those questions. Surely he knows by now. <laughs> Queensland's certainly in the box seat. I heard a few murmurs of maybe some Australian bands like a Powderfinger or someone up here who might be in the mix for that gig if Queensland get it, of course. I would have said two weeks ago Queensland certainly in the box seat and probably still are, of course, a big growth area for the AFL, a big, a big chance for the AFL to grow the game in a non-AFL state. 
But a few community cases have uh, occurred again on the Gold Coast and Brisbane. I think that would be a slight concern for the AFL. But more importantly, Perth, despite the fact they've supposedly been playing hard to get, they have been putting a lot of work into this behind the scenes. Their bid is much more significant financially. So I am a little bit worried about Perth's bid because I, I don't want this... Uh, well, I won't say holiday because I've been working very hard, Shane, <laughs> but I don't want this trip to come to an end just yet because obviously heading to Perth involves that 14-day quarantine. Oh, no, you deserve another quarantine. <laughs> hey, um, so it's going to be sort of like a Steve Bradbury-style uh, win, really, from uh, West Australia, if they can do that. Obviously, Brisbane being the front runners for a long time for what they've done for the game. But I, I've, got, I've got a tip. If it does go to Brisbane... And the Gabba, they're going to do a Twilight thing. I reckon Movie World's just down the road. So go and get the stunt drivers from there, from the police academy, to do a few jumps and a few things, a few firecrackers. And I'll tell you what, we will absolutely love it. Yeah, it could be a very different feel. We might have to get the Wiz Warwick Kappa back up here with the meter maids and all that sort of Gold Coast, uh, Queensland flavour. But that will be decided on Tuesday, the AFL Commission. <laughs> To meet then, we might move on before I put my foot in it there, mentioning the whiz and everything that he got up to while he was uh, based up here. Uh, he had the time of his life. It's now time for our four points. And this is what we're going to do. The Joe Danaher Show. He was on fire. It was great to see. And what is incredible, he never had any lead-up matches, so Essendon did an incredible job from a fitness point of view to get him ready to play well. And, gee, he did. Not only did he kick goals, he, he moved well, he pushed up the field, his field kicking was super. And I love his energy and enthusiasm. He's a super player, and it's great to have him back. Uh, pie Warmers, Collingwood won four out of their last five games. They just keep getting the job done. The doubters are coming, but guess what? They keep getting the four points. They've pretty much secured themselves a final spot, I think. And uh, a great effort from the Collingwood Football Club. The Giants, uh, we don't trust them yet still, but uh, it was a very good win. They were OK in the second half against West Coast last week, very good against Fremantle, and starting to team well. So have they turned the corner? And I'll tell you what, uh, this one's about the Cats, and this is not the uh, Geelong Cats. This is about a cat that is missing its owner, um, and it's your catch, Ayrton. Here it is, taking in what it saw on the news the other day in Melbourne during COVID time. <laughs> oh, look at that. Yeah, isn't that nice, Croft? Look, unlike uh, probably your three kids who want to boot you out of the house while you're... Oh. Uh, Dis four kids, sorry. You've yep. got, you got four kids. Sorry. I think so. I haven't seen one for a few <laughs> weeks, but I'm pretty sure I've got four. <laughs> <laughs> I know they want to boot you out of the house while you're homeschooling them at the moment, and I don't think they've been taking your disciplining too well. So uh, unlike that, I am dearly loved in my household, Croft. So, uh, yeah, hey, look, good I, to see you. It was beautiful. And uh, even though you don't know the, the type of cat that you've got and even the name <laughs> of the cat, what's the name of the cat? <laughs> Billy is the name of the cat. Billy, yeah. No, no, that was very nice, and uh, that's why we wanted to put it in, because I know you've been away, you've sacrificed a lot, OK? You've virtually packed your, your suitcase and off you went, and you've been in this hub for a long time, um, although we're pretty jealous of you now. But initially, we thought that's a big effort. Um, so we thought we'd give something back and, and show little Billy, your beautiful, beautiful little cat, is even though missing you, still getting a little glimpse of you every now and then on the TV. Although... I'm, I'm pretty sure I heard Billy go, oh, he's getting a nice tan and beautiful white teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that, the talking cat. <laughs> you are an idiot, Croft, and I think that is a great way to end this show thanks to AIA Vitality.